I V M. Hi, everybody. On behalf of the team at IVM Podcast, I have a request for you. We'd really appreciate it if you could go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey and fill out our survey over there. It's going to take a few minutes to do, but it gives us some really interesting information that we can take to advertisers and brands about who's listening to the network. If you're comfortable giving us your email address while you're filling out the survey, we'll enter you into a random drawing where we'll be sending out a bunch of IVM swag to some of our listeners. Last year, we sent out coffee mugs, and this year we're hoping to send out much cooler stuff. That's ivmpodcast.com slash survey. We really appreciate your help. Hi and welcome to Nuyo Kanoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode in edition. Uh, in today's episode in edition, we have someone very interesting uh, across the continents, I would say. Again, someone of an Asian origin, someone who's multi-diverse, who's really taken, I say, the badge of being a complete woman forward. And someone who's a dynamic personality has achieved multiple feats. I would like to welcome our today's guest, Miss Kenya Jade Pinto on the show. And uh, I would not introduce her because uh, I would not have the apt words to introduce her. So I would like Kenya to introduce herself. Kenya, thank you for, uh, you know, being with us. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, so my name is Kenya Jade Pinto, and I'm a, a lawyer, filmmaker, photographer um, based out of Toronto. Um, I'm Indo-Kenyan Canadian, so my heritage is, you know, my grandparents were from Goa, but um, my father grew up in Kenya and so did I. Um, and then subsequently we moved to Canada. And so I've been here for most of my adult life now, but traveled quite a bit in between. Um, and my work sort of like brings me in between spaces. I describe myself as a, um, a bit of a, a multi-hyphenate navigating between law, human rights, um, storytelling with photography and filmmaking. And yeah, so I've just, I've been working on a few different projects, mostly related to um, displacement, belonging and access to justice. And I'm sorry if you can hear some like bells jingle jangling in the back. That's my dog. She's, That's okay. <laughs> she's looking for treats. So she's, she's, yeah, sniffing around. It's holiday season, so we do understand, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit festive sounds for the season. Santa has come early for her. <laughs> <laughs> no, right, Kenya, thank you so much for that brief intro, in fact. And uh, that is the precise reason we have her today with us. Because, see, uh, the idea of, you know, uh, of promoting diversity and inclusion, right, is something which is global. It is not only subject to India. Uh, in India, this is a new concept in terms of people now trying to understand uh, diversity, human rights, people trying to understand multiple professions. And uh, maybe Kenya, can you start with introducing this whole concept to us? Because you've done so much, right? You've, you've also ventured into human rights. And I read a couple of your online blogs and I read some stuff on that, that you have been actually working quite closely on the human rights aspect, displacement aspect. Can you please take us through that? Because it's a global, it's a global legal thing rather than I would say being regional subjugated, subjugated to India and otherwise, and I'll, we'll get India into it uh, subsequently, right? But can you just highlight all of this journey that you've had as a lawyer and how did you transition into, you know, the whole human rights thing and, and the work you did there? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, so I, I did my undergraduate uh, degree in international relations, sort of knowing that I, I came from this um, worldview where I was brought up in Kenya and, and had sort of, um, yeah, I, I felt like I had a broader scope of view compared to my peers. And I wanted to continue on that journey to understand how things worked internationally. So I did an undergraduate in international relations and throughout my undergraduate degree, fell in love with, um, with photography and started to sort right. of see a link between, you know, photography being a tool to tell stories related to, you know, some of the broader themes that I was studying at the time. And after my undergraduate degree, I sort of was playing with the idea of doing a master's in photojournalism because I thought I'm going to be a photojournalist. Um, that's really the space I wanted to be in. And I'm, and the tug was also pulling me towards law because I thought, well, I thought storytelling could only go so far and law would allow me a broader set of tools um, to sort of unpack some of these hard questions uh, that I was right. thinking through in my undergraduate degree. And I couldn't, I couldn't choose just one, um, but I decided right. to go 
towards law, knowing full well that I likely wasn't going to be a practicing lawyer in the traditional sense, that it was really, you know, a, a sharpening the tools in my tool belt uh, that would allow me to, to think critically, to understand systemic inequity, to untangle complex ideas um, in an, a new and different way. Right. And so in addition to that, I, I continued on with um, with documentary photography as well throughout my my law studies. So after my first year of law school, I, I was um, lucky to get to work with Photographers Without Borders and uh, I was working as a legal intern at the International Commission of Jurists. And at wow. the time, the ICJ in Kenya, they were doing public interest litigation against the government for atrocities that had been committed during post-election violence in 2007, 2008. Wow. And they were hoping to sort of create a campaign to educate the public and the, the wider public to understand that at a time when the Kenyan government was saying, you know, there are no internally displaced people in Kenya, we knew that just wasn't the case. And we wanted to provide the opportunity for the petitioners in the case to tell their stories in their own words. Right. Um, and so that was really the first time that I started to understand that there was an opportunity to kind of blend these two parts of me together. You know, this part of me that's very analytical, that can framework, that can unpack dense, complicated topics. And then another part of me that's artistic that can spend that can sit in somebody else's space and be invited into that space and and be a conduit to to them telling their own story and amplifying their own narrative no absolutely and you know why i asked you this was because a lot of asian women right now are coming into the picture and you're the younger generation you belong to a generation that's really speaking out at least from an asian and, and i i'm saying it again and again from an asian perspective is the reason why because a lot of uh, uh you know the indian diaspora that we have whether it's women men etc now are reaching out and going out of their boundaries and uh, earlier in india you wouldn't see so m- so many women come out and and you know maybe approach this fact and you could be that ray of light for them uh, having that heritage and doing so well on an international platform, right? Because uh, I mean, the whole aspect of this diversity concept is to empower women as well, to make them as part of the whole uh, gambit as a legal system. And you've balanced both, right? I mean, I mean, working with ICJ on a concept, having that intellectual connect to be able to balance yourself with filmmaking, storytelling, that's a multidimensional thing. Now your journey as a lawyer, let's start with that and then we'll come to the other two. In your journey as a lawyer and working with so many uh, international organizations and and you being a woman was it a challenge at all that you faced while doing uh, such stuff in the field of law let's start with that because we know the other two fields are little emancipated and more open uh, but then <laughs> for law it comes out as you know uh, heavily bombarded with men uh, ruling the roost right I mean I'm using the very direct word out of it yeah yeah that's a really yeah. great question. You know, I think, um, you know, things are changing slowly but surely. But as you mentioned, you know, law is an old boys club, it always has been. And yes. to some extent, you know, without quite a radical change in pedagogy through law school, you know, to the firms, mm-hmm. I think, I, I think, you know, it, it will require a, quite a big shakeup for things to change. And so I think anybody, you know, who is racialized in, I'll speak to the Canadian context because that's what yeah, I know, course, but anybody who's, who's racialized in this space, mm-hmm. you know, there's sort of, you have to be, we have to be honest with where we are at and we're certainly nowhere near where we should be. You're, you're seeing circumstances where if you have a name that's hard to pronounce, mm-hmm. um, you're less likely to be called for an interview or less likely to, to make partner Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because a lot of the ways these firms have traditionally worked is to make decisions on whether somebody can join a team based on how likely or not a partner, largely mm-hmm. middle-aged white men, uh, <laughs> would like to have a beer with you at two o'clock in the morning when you're working late wow. night on that factum. Wow. So you can imagine that what, you know when you're making hiring decisions with that kind of framework, mm-hmm. what kind of bias that leaves Absolutely. Uh, in the process. And there's a woman actually who I'd really like to shout out. Shout out. Her name's Hadia Roderick. Yes. Um, she wrote this incredible article uh, in, I think it was in the Globe and Mail, called Black on Bay Street, where she sort of outlines her experiences at a top tier law firm, you know, having gone to a top tier law school and being a black woman and what that meant for her and how challenging it was. And, and, and then eventually sort of her transition out of that space and why she felt like, 
you know, she was called to other things. Um, and I think that really speaks clearly to where we're sort of at in the mm-hmm. legal profession in Canada. You know, my context is also very Toronto specific, um, mm-hmm. where, you know, the, the other, the other side of it is I, I spent a lot of my teen years in Calgary and mm-hmm. I, I always, I differentiate the West coast of Canada to the East coast of mm-hmm. Canada or not that Toronto's the East coast, but you know, to the East part of Canada in, in the following way, which is that, in Calgary, it really felt like more of the Wild West, shall we say, where okay. there's lots of racial issues there, don't get me wrong, but right. there's more of this sense that if you work hard, it's a bit more of a meritocracy. Like, really? you work hard, you try, to, you try to get that job, you might get it, there's going to be some racial bias along the way, for sure. Wow. Um, but there's less of this kind of like legacy, family, deep-rooted... Mm-hmm our family have been here for, you know, hundreds of years. And my uncle works at this firm and his dad worked at that firm. And I didn't know that before. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm the first generation of my family to be a lawyer Mm -hmm. and I didn't know how deep rooted uh, the legal community was here and what it meant to have a last name that was on the the door of a law firm and how they gave you a leg up, um, so I, I learned a lot kind of just moving through spaces and realizing that it was going to take a lot more uh, if that's the path that somebody wants. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will take you a bit, <laughs> a lot more uh, if you wow. don't already come from a legacy space yes. to make a, a path for yourself. Not that it's impossible, but, uh, you know, I don't want to be shy about saying that it's really hard and, and um, we're just just starting to have these hard conversations at the institutional level, at the firm level, but they're not as nuanced as they could be. And there's definitely opportunity for that to change in my view. No. And, and you know what I'm shocked about a couple of things that, you know, when we see uh, and, and why I again, reiterate again, is this, that doing this episode with you was important because a lot of Indian women, specifically from India, urban cities, et cetera, move to Canada in the hope of achieving their dreams in a better way, whether it is employment, whether it's having a, a standard of life, etc. But what shocks me in the interim is that there are so many laws, correct me if I'm wrong there, and a multi-jurisdictional uh, uh, you know, uh, country where, they, I mean, they, they do talk about being liberal, uh, racism is something which is considered even by uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and everybody, and I'm not getting into politics at all. All I'm saying is that uh, diversity, inclusion, LGBT, so many issues, so many things, and yet someone asking you for a 2 a.m. drink uh, is sexual harassment, borderline sexual harassment, because making any such advance, maybe if it's in a fun way, uh, qualifies to be sexual harassment. So we are quite shocked on that part of things that, you know, I mean, aren't there sufficient laws that safeguard you against this? Or is this also so ingrained in the system that uh, superficially, yes, uh, there is a there is a barrier to this, but somewhere underlying it is still existing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I should caveat that that statement, which is, you know, really just kind of like a, it's 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 how law firms have traditionally explained whether or not you're a good, like, quote unquote, cultural fit cultural. to a firm. Yes, yes. So it's less it's less about actually going for that 2 a.m. beer as it is, you know, are you a kind of person? Are you the quote unquote kind of person that I want to be around uh, at 2 a.m. or, you know, do I want to spend my personal time with you? Uh, Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, you, you touch on some important things, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't know how to speak to them because I haven't had that experience and I don't know what, right. you know, what the prevalence of that looks like. Um, although, you know, yeah, I, I just wouldn't know what the statistics look like and how, how pervasive it is in, it's specific to our industry, but it wouldn't surprise me. But it's just to say that this idea of a quote unquote cultural fit to a firm is is extremely problematic when we know that we gravitate to people who are like us. And if people making decisions all look and think a certain way, well, then they're going to gravitate to people who look and think like them. Um, And that's why, you know, you don't see, you know, women of color storming the ranks of law firms at the high level. Uh, And you have to wonder why uh, women of color don't stay in those roles uh, Mm -hmm. for the long term. You know, what are the the sort of systemic barriers that prevent women from from continuing on those paths? And it's not to say that that happens to every woman, but 
But I think, you know, by and large, if you look at the trends, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty deplorable. Um, No, and it's quite shocking what you're saying. You know why I would say so? Because, you know, uh, uh, in India as well, when we speak about this law firm culture and we discuss how the law firms exist and what kind of racism exists, or I would say uh, sexual harassment exists in workplaces, right? A lot of people have laws. We have company laws, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, I'm not getting into that. Today's discussion is not about that. But uh, superficially it exists. And when a lot of women lawyers, they do ask me that, you know, hey, I mean, uh, we've read a lot about uh, situations where if we go overseas, it's going to be better, it's going to be different. But the law firm culture, which I've seen out of my experience is potentially the same worldwide. Um, there is not much scope for especially being colored and then entering a foreign law firm. Even for men, I would say it's it's not only women, women definitely being mm-hmm. there. But even for men, it's so tough. Uh, there is a huge competition. I've had a friend who had a very complex name and I'll, I'm not going to name that gentleman, but he had the similar experience uh, not in Canada, but at least in US, he had the same, even though he was hardworking, he was a topper here. Uh, exceptions are there, as you said, but it's something that does exist. And thank you so much for highlighting that because that's an eye opener for many uh, prospective people who would might think that, you know, it's all the merry same. We have to fight against this wherever we are. And uh, I think that would make more sense of it. Coming to the second part, Yana, now I'll I'll shift from this to the next part, which is the humanitarian work that you've done right? You've worked on these issues. Can you please talk something about it? Maybe something in the domain where people can be educated about the world problems that are going on and what kind of issues have you handled? Because that, that intrigues all of us here. Sure. Um, well, like I mentioned, my I started to, to see that there was sort of this connection between storytelling and social justice when I was working at the ICJ in Kenya. And when I came back to Canada after that summer, I uh, I was really lucky to get to work at uh, a nonprofit called Level Justice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I summered there, I articled there, and uh, eventually I was called to the bar. Um, I did my licensing exams though quite reluctantly because I kept thinking, why am I doing these exams if I don't, if I know that I don't want to be a solicitor, but I did it. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad that I did in the end. I'm glad I'm very grateful to be licensed. And then, uh, I've since been working on narrative and nonfiction projects that navigate themes of displacement, belonging and access to justice. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the projects uh, that I'm most recently working on is with the refugee law lab at York university, uh, mm-hmm. And the newly formed Migration Technology Monitor, um, which is based out of Athens and led by the wow. formidable Petra Molnar, who's a, an international human rights lawyer working in the space wow. of, of refugee and, and, and migrant law. And specifically what she's looking at is technology in migratory spaces and, and how it's impacting people on the move, which you can imagine is a very sort of new space Absolutely. to be learning about researching and um, yeah, Petra Molnar is this incredible researcher, incredibly empathetic lawyer woman, um, but also, you know, has, has published uh, a report called bots at the gate, which was looking at AI um, processes in immigration in Canada Mm -hmm. and how it was impact immigration, immigration to Canada. Um, And now she's published a report called technological testing grounds sort of starting to interrogate how technology is impacting people in refugee camps. And specifically, she and I were looking at the case study of Lesvos uh, early this, this fall. We wow. traveled to Greece. Um, she's, she's there full time now, and I'm right. sort of there part time. Right. Um, but we went to Lesvos, and we were there in the aftermath of a fire on mm-hmm. Moria, right. where, the, where the camp had burned down. And we're just starting to see the sort of burgeoning processes that we can imagine will become, you know, a robust mechanism to control and surveil folks who are living in the camps. And so um, my role is, is more as a storyteller to help Mm -hmm. sort of unpack and think through what's happening. Um, And, and Petra is, is really sort of leading the charge on the research. And it's been a, a really kind of beautiful collaboration because we're starting to think through these themes together and kind of bring these different skill sets to the table, uh, which has been really, really fun and dynamic. Interesting. You know why I asked you again, this was because 
uh, surprisingly, the amount of exposure and the kind of work that you're doing, right, displacement of refugees, even here in India, if I would say, uh, and recently with we share borders with Myanmar, Bangladesh, and, uh, and, and the kind of, you know, refugees we had, it was Rohingya refugees working in and the UN intervened and so many things happened. And then we had refugees from Bangladesh who poured in. But surprisingly, even in the international law sector, uh, there is very... I mean, I would say, especially India and then other countries as well. It's, um, I mean, we have even, uh, I would say, engagement equivalent to zilch uh, amount of people being involved in this. And this opens up a huge opportunity for someone who's trying to, uh, you know, get into this international law space and look at it expand. Because uh, the kind of opportunities you're speaking about, which kind of puts uh, you into a global diaspora where you can address these problems is something uh, of a brilliant of an exposure to have, whether it is research uh, for all the law students in India, or when you start in your, and this is just a piece of advice, when you start early uh, in your uh, law school, and uh, since we have five-year law here, and it's more over the same, I think in Canada as well, depending on the course you go into, but uh, you should look at these opportunities. You should apply to such places. Uh, it's a piece of advice because the kind of exposure you get on research methodology on on learning the curve, on understanding different issues from a holistic approach uh, and balancing a legal approach is a must. Uh, you should volunteer. I'm going to ask any, of course, in the towards the end of it to put up with uh, and give us the information where people can definitely, you know, how can they volunteer and, and et cetera and so forth, so on. And now we'll shift uh, from the legal side of things to something very interesting, which intrigues me. I want to talk about inclusion, like a five minute from you on inclusion how inclusive is canada let's start with that forget uh, i would not even include gender in it let's just talk how inclusive is canada as a workspace and specifically toronto and calgary both and how did you find uh, the inclusive policies there that have helped you in becoming what you are oh my gosh that is yes. a big and unfair question <laughs> oh my gosh i don't even know where to start there but um Okay, well, yeah. you're a lawyer, so you know that, you know, I I will caveat everything by yes. saying it, de- yes. it depends. <laughs> yes. Uh, it depends on, on a lot of things, a lot of intersecting privileges, a lot of, uh, you know, access. Right. Depending on who you are. Um, I think, you know, generally... Canadians in Canada, we are we have this international, what do you call it, um, reputation as being very inclusive and welcoming. And it's true that, for example, we are one of the few countries that has quite a robust immigration and refugee system. We have we're one of the very few that do private sponsorship for refugees. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't see ourselves as a melting pot, quote unquote, but rather as a cultural mosaic. Mm-hmm. And so in many ways, I think this place is, is, a really, is a really great place to be yourself, to, to come at who, as you are, who you are, and, and create a really beautiful life for yourself if you want to. At the same time, yes, uh, we have- That's what you're waiting for. <laughs> yeah, we still, you know, we still, there's a lot of problems. I think, I think, especially right now with what's happening with our neighbors to the South, it's very easy to sort of l- turn our noses up and look down there and say, well, we're not as bad as you guys are. So, you know, we're doing just fine. Um, and that's just, that's just simply not true. I think there's, there's lots of places right. where racism exists, where um, things are inequitable and it maybe is just, it's maybe more insidious because you have to look a bit harder to see it. You have to squint your eyes to sort of make out what's happening. But, but if you're a racialized person, and um, I think in Canada, our Black and Indigenous communities know this best, so I won't mm-hmm. speak on their behalf, but I think, right. I think that it's, it, it's really, excuse my language, yep. challenging. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, so and, and I mean, like, you know, we're seeing it at the, you know, Calgary is different than Toronto. And one of the things right. that I, I say is, is Toronto has, has lots of issues. There's problems with, you know, access to housing here because um, right. it's such, such an expensive city to live in. And if you don't have a certain amount, it's, it's just very, it's very difficult to make, yeah, to make a life for yourself in, in this city. 
Uh, and yet, it's the first city that I've been in since growing up in, in Mombasa and being in Nairobi where I have felt seen, you know, in, in all of my intersectionalities as a biracial woman who wow. speaks multiple languages, who grew up abroad. I know that I can meet someone in Toronto who has a very similar, if not slightly different experience, and we can bond over that, where my my experiences in Calgary were maybe more limited. Um, I felt like, like a little bit more of a, an outlier in that way. Mm-hmm. And similarly with Ottawa, because that's where I went to law school. I lived there for three years. Uh, beautiful, lovely city, but again, like never really felt truly seen until I came to Toronto. So there's something really beautiful and magical about this place in that way. Yeah, not to say that it doesn't have its problems because it does, but of course, I think of we're sort of starting to, yeah, unpack some of those. And and for me, this is just my experience of feeling seen and and recognizing that there's a real privilege in that, in in, in being seen and recognized and and having a community who who see me. I don't know how, how to course. put that better, but, but no, yeah. Of course, of course. And you know why, again, I would say it's such a beautiful experience that you're giving out for people to know. Uh, and when I get this context, say you're, I mean, you're from a, a different ethnic background like us and you're working um, and you've been given an equal opportunity, at least in some of the fields. Whereas when I, when I compare this to India and I've had so many guests on the show uh, that, you know, uh, due to certain issues, women here as well, do not get represented, uh, you know, represented the way they should. That's one part of it. But the LGBT community, and uh, I mean, and I'm using only the LGBT, I'm not even going further, because we still have a long way to go in India to recognize them as well. But and and I train corporates on LGBT, and I do a lot of social work with a couple of NGOs to educate the youth of the slums and other areas so that, you know, the growing population knows the youngsters know what all of these concepts are, which we learned during our late 20s, I would say. But, uh, you know, it's so challenging here. I mean, I've had heard, I mean, uh, people had challenges. uh, I mean, and renowned people like I had uh, a close friend and a supermodel uh, who belongs to the transgender community. I mean, working for CK and international brands and cover of magazines not being given a place on rent in Mumbai because the person had a different sexual orientation and the person is a very very well known uh, personality being on my show her name is uh, I wish I should not name rather I would say if I name uh, but again uh, taking the liberty as you say Kavi is uh, is Anjali Lama and uh, she's a supermodel she was here she spoke to me about everything and yet again the challenge of getting the passport changed here and you know her wanting a better life and and so forth, so on. So, you know, in that context, I feel uh, the environment and exposure you get somewhere overseas, maybe in your domain where you've been from being a different ethnic background, I think there's more inclusion, right? And that's why uh, maybe your experience can um, be an eye-opener to many people here because a lot of people do move uh, on, on these issues, especially the LGBT community, uh, feeling that their rights are not recognized, that recognition is not there, and hence they move overseas to get uh, a better life. Right. So, I mean, that's a challenge which we are facing here. And, and uh, I, I also realize that, the, I mean, Canada recognizes more than, I think, 168 genders, if I'm not wrong, or, or maybe over that. But uh, that's such a welcome move. And uh, from somebody who's going from such a, uh, a constrained, uh, you know, uh, environment uh, over, all over Asia, I would say, and then moving there, it's a huge, huge difference that can make to someone's uh, corporate performance, right? Because uh, employees are dissuaded from working if they're not given acceptance to who they are. So, uh, I mean, uh, great to have your views on that. Now we'll shift to the fun part of things, which is <laughs> your filmmaking, right? And your storytelling and, and, and uh, all of that. How did you manage that being a lawyer? Because a law school really takes up whole of your time. <laughs> and to have that orientation of switching and being multitasking uh, is quite a different ball game, isn't it? So how did you manage to do that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, well, I, uh, you know, I mentioned that I knew that I, pretty, pretty early that I wasn't going to practice in a traditional sense. I didn't know necessarily what that meant. I just, I just knew that I probably wasn't going to be at a, a large law firm. I thought maybe I would be a nonprofit. Um, Maybe I would find a way to sort of, yeah, I, I actually, I didn't fully know what that meant, but I, I let my intuition guide me uh, in many ways. And so I knew that as I was going through law school, I was going to feel unfulfilled if I didn't also pursue and work on 
um, documentary photography in tandem and, and mm-hmm. continue to sort of finesse those skills and be really a really great photographer, not just, you know, someone who's a hobbyist, though there's nothing wrong with that. But I really wanted, I really wanted to have lighting skills and I wanted to understand how truly to operate my camera properly. And I wanted to, to, yeah, I just wanted to be really good at both. Um, and it was really hard because law school is very hard. <laughs> and, of course, law school is very hard. <laughs> and it's uh, just time consuming. You know, there's a lot of reading. There's sort of like, it's kind of like a, uh, it's a very strange pressure cooker kind of an in, of an environment. And so balancing those two things was maybe, you know, what I found challenging. Um, but I, I, I was lucky, like I mentioned, to, to have the opportunity to work with Photographers Without Borders on an assignment and then with ICJ Kenya. And then when I started working at the nonprofit, um, mm-hmm. I was really, really lucky to have a mentor by the name of Brittany Twiss, who's now mm-hmm. the executive uh, director or the national director at Pro Bono Students Canada, who wow. valued my skill set as a photographer and and encouraged me to to think about how I could bring that skill set as first as a student director as like a as a summer student and then mm-hmm. as an articling student um, and then as a program manager. So she really gave me the space to explore that side of me and then the confidence um, to leave her to to make the decision to move into film and photography full time. Wow. And to call that my, yeah, the space that I live and work in. No, in fact, in fact, you know, why I, uh, why I feel this is a tough task is because I think being a lawyer also opens up gates for being, uh, or for, for accessing different uh, opportunities for work. I mean, the amount of research we get to do, the amount of analytical skills we tend to use, it really equips you, doesn't it, to enter into a different profession than, uh, than what you want to be. And most of the lawyers out of law schools actually turn out to do something different than, than uh, what they were supposed to do. That also uh, is a true story because I happen to be a lawyer and I'm, I'm doing podcasting as well. Of course, I do mm-hmm. handle the legal side of things. But I have seen that, you know, my law uh, uh, career entitled me to have uh, this public forum to stand up and speak about issues, have discussions, uh, go out in the market, talk to people, uh, maybe enhance my business development skills. I think that really adds up to overall uh, your personality and maybe even gives you the hindsight to look at a different career altogether, doesn't it? Sure. And I think the biggest thing for me and what what helps me sort of uh, yeah, think through new opportunities or open new doors is, is just to have a genuine curiosity. So if something seems interesting to you, explore that thing. It doesn't have to be in a very robust and, and official way. It can be, you know, I'm going to take a workshop on that particular thing over the weekend because I like it and I find it interesting and it may, I may choose not to monetize it, but I am Mm -hmm. genuinely curious about that thing and I'm going to learn more about it. And, and I think for me, that's, that's, what's, that's what has allowed me to progress um, because it's allowed me to finesse my skills, to, to get a little bit better, um, to reach a little bit farther. Uh, and, and I think it's hard to think about that when you're in law school, because when I was in law school, it was hard to be curious when things were just kind of being thrown at me and I had to learn them. And then I had to regurgitate it on a test and I had to make sure that my <laughs> grades were high enough so that I could apply to a clerkship if I wanted to, because everybody is applying to a clerkship. And, and you know, so I get it. I think it's, it's very hard to stay curious, but if you make space for that curiosity and even if you don't tell anybody about it, but you, you yep. cultivate that as a daily practice, like, oh, I'm really curious about this particular issue and I haven't really read anything about it. Maybe I'll look it up and just, just learn about it. Um, it. I think that those things sort of snowball and, and you create opportunities for yourself to, yeah, to, to follow new paths if you, if you think about it that way. Wow. And, and I do understand all of that because I think law schools here are a little, little mellow, I would say a uh, 20% than what we have uh, maybe in Canada or anywhere else. Uh, to all the law students, again, do not get into the rat race at all. 
you need to understand what your calling is. This profession which you're entering into actually equips you to deal with uh, multiple things. It uh, equips you to handle multiple situations, try to harness your inner in a calling, try to use it. And uh, for all the women out there, Kenya is a living example. If you're an Asian, you have the spirit, you want to be somewhere. Uh, she is already there and doing so much at uh, being a lawyer, being a filmmaker and a storyteller and a photographer and whatnot. And I'm, I mean, I'm out of words, but uh, it is all about being, uh, you know, spirited to handle all of that. And uh, the law school, I would say again, as an experience of a law student is not a joke uh, overseas. It is really tough to cope up with everything. And then you have these long barrister and solicitor exams, which are like seven hours, depending on the province you are in. Uh, I mean, I think British Columbia has about two exams, but <laughs> Toronto has a seven hour grueling exam where you need to draft wheels and, and whatnot. So uh, leaving all that aside for all prospective law students, you need to gear up any case, whether you're here or there. Uh, but on a funny note, I think someone who's a couch potato like me and a lazy bum, I think this profession is tough to handle. And uh, maybe I'll <laughs> I'll alternate my career if I if I ever move to Canada and get my way through somewhere. Coming now to the storytelling part of things, uh, Kenya, that's interesting. Now, tell us something about that. I want to know about that and what do you precisely do in that? Yeah. So, um, so right now I'm really lucky to be working on sort of a few projects and being freelance. That's sort of how it goes. Uh, you, you kind of have different projects at different stages of development. I mentioned one to you, which is the project I'm working on with Petra about Mm -hmm. looking at Mm -hmm. technology and migratory spaces. So that's very early for us. We just started, you know, with, with her, she, she, uh, she drafted this report, which, which accompanied a report to the UN General Assembly this fall. And I did the documentary photography for that project. So um, the report's called Technological Testing Grounds. If you look it up, um, Petra's beautiful brain and, and my images. Um, and then the other projects that I'm working on right now, uh, I'm working with an incredible team at Compi Films in Toronto, mm-hmm. uh, two folks by the name of Shasha Nakai and Rich Williamson, who are co-directing a feature-length film called Scarborough, based on the award-winning win- novel written by Catherine Hernandez. Mm-hmm. And it's about three children sort of navigating systemic oppression in a suburb of Toronto in a place called Scarborough. Wow. And, um, and it's a fiction feature, so... Mm-hmm. My role on that project has been associate producer. I really just support Shasha in a ton of different things. And because we are such a bare bones production in terms of the budget, we're a micro budget funded by Telefilm. We've had to wear many hats, uh, which has been really exciting for me, actually. You know, everything Mm -hmm. from, you know, I I drafted the COVID policies when we were trying to figure out how to, how to, um, how to go back to production during, during the pandemic to getting ice cream sandwiches for a child <laughs> who's our lead actor. Wow. Um, yeah, really just, you wow. know, really yeah. just doing a little bit of everything. And it's been such an incredible, rewarding experience. Uh, that film will come out in 2021. Um, mm-hmm. So keep, keep your eyes and ears tuned for that. Of course. Um, we'll promote and then the other, the- yeah. Yeah, we'll promote the whole whole uh, whole scenario here once we'll have you back again on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I'm also working on uh, a couple projects that have been commissioned by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, specifically wow. as, a, as an archival and legal researcher. So it's kind of okay. where you can see law and uh, storytelling can blend because I'm helping the directors sort of think through the story as it relates to issues relating to law. So the first project is about post-conflict Liberia mm-hmm. and thinking about the international justice mechanisms that serve people in that country. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the second project is about, um, you know, potential wrongful conviction in Ontario and sort of unpacking the legal issues around um, the criminal proceedings there. So, so I think that this is that you are not only harnessing the legal side of things, you're pretty much a lawyer, except for the fact that you're just not practicing, you're short of that. 
and you're being a wonderful uh, uh, you know storyteller and a filmmaker that's it's really <laughs> smart and interesting to to have both sides of uh, the things to you and and again i reiterate for lawyers who are doing this look at the amount of opportunities you have it's not just that you have to open barracks read these sections and go about it you can do so much if you have a vision and you want to follow that vision and uh, of course we are all not so competent and uh, don't have the same intelligence as she does and uh, i place untrue, myself there untrue. You know, untrue. and and that's how she's managed to be here but lawyers by default i would say in a law school look out for these opportunities uh, i would rather give out kenya's details towards the end of the show now where you can get in touch with her maybe and and she can be your mentor to guide you on what needs to be done provided she is comfortable entertaining such things but uh, again uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, we are now planning uh, subsequently to have someone even more interesting along with kenya on the show right so uh, we're going to roll out those details uh, further down the line uh, and uh, thank you so much for being here uh, this kenya jade pinto i would take the full name i've been actually <laughs> using a first name uh, as per my convenience and uh, i hope she doesn't mind that so no uh, thank you so much for being here with us uh, it was such a wonderful interaction we've loved the whole concept you really highlighted a lot of things one message you want to send out to asian women especially in india in the field of law uh, as to how they can become better lawyers or can change their field or maybe move to canada oh my gosh you are always asking me very difficult questions um, <laughs> one thing one thing i don't know i mean i think for me the biggest the biggest thing is uh curiosity so follow that i think we um we are trained as lawyers to sort of push things down and and be steadfast and and just keep pushing ahead and i think sometimes it will serve you well to take stock of where you're at and really think about why am i being moved to feel this way um and once you start to unpack that i think it really it for me at least in my experience boils down to curiosity so let your curiosity guide you whatever that looks like at whatever stage you're at right i think a very well said uh, and very uh, diplomatically summarized by you but uh, i would say that uh, go fetch your dreams guys and uh, for all the law students out there there's ample amount of international opportunities if you're not able to score them here you feel you're being challenged you have an international dream you want to accomplish something there are different avenues you just need to find out and reach there with passion and any last details how people can get in touch with you maybe to take a a volunteer on the kind of work you're doing or maybe just for the information would you want to roll out your official email id for them yeah sure i'm i'm always happy to chat um so my email address is hello@kenyajade.com um and then i'm also on socials twitter and instagram at @kenyajade so you can find me there yes and before people start judging here in india uh, she's actually a goan guy so she's the most chill human being you can have uh, <laughs> on the show so don't forget the goan spirit here before you start taking kenya into consideration kenya thank you so much for being with us as a lawyer it was wonderful to interact with you and uh, thanks for being here and we'll have you shortly in our next series uh, on episodes with interesting stuff coming up thank you so much thank you so much for having me I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I wanted to kind of just give a quick reminder to everybody. As I mentioned up top, we are doing our annual listener survey right now. If you could please go and take a couple of minutes out of your day and fill it out, we would really, really appreciate it. It's ivmpodcast.com slash survey. If you're comfortable giving us your email address, we'll enter you into a random drawing and we're going to be sending out swag to a bunch of randomly selected listeners. So do definitely get on board that train. Let me tell you a little bit about what we did on the network this week. We launched a new show called Zindagi Diaries with Ragini Kumar. Many of you might have seen Ragini on television during the IPL. She's a presenter, but she's showing a different side of herself over here with a poetry podcast. Give it a shot, give it a listen. Let me know what you all think. Vishal Gondal is back this week after a while. He's been on an extended break, but he has Rahul Narvekar for the first episode. Really interesting conversation. Do check it out. Raji Saman joins Gauri Devi Dayal on This Round Is On Me. The two talk about the wine business and what's going on there. 
We had a number of conversations about the farmers' bill and the surrounding agitation this week on the network as well. Maruk and Nayat had a great episode on the note. Pulia Bazi did a deep dive into the issues around this, and on Siders we have our typical, you know, fun conversation about the stuff with a little bit of seriousness, a little bit of fun. Do check that out on Cock and Bull on Thursday last week. Akash Mehta joined us for that episode, and with that, I hope to see you again next week. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, a show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. Robo advisory, startups, just name it. We've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday, and you can listen to my show on the IVM Podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have.